Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to discuss viruses. And in particular, I'd like to talk to you about the discovery of viruses. You know, viruses are um, not necessarily our most favorite things to discuss because they cause uh, sometimes some horrific uh, illnesses, but it's important to know how they work. And in order to totally understand how they work and what their, their structure is and how they replicate, I think it's relevant to, to look into the historical aspects of how they were discovered. And it's kind of interesting, um, and I hope you enjoyed this video on this. The one I want to say at first is this particular um, bacteria right here is being infected by viruses. And so viruses don't really uh, affect just animal cells. They, they can infect plants. They can even infect bacteria. And Though bacteria are smallest living organisms, viruses are not considered to be living things, and so they're not part of the normal classification scheme. And that, that's something that I just wanted to say right out of the gate. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge microbiologists because most of our understanding of the structure of DNA, how it's been replicated, um, steps involved in uh, transcription and translation have all come from the study of uh, bacteria and viruses. And so just to give you a, a little perspective of what we're discussing here, um, bacteria, shown right here, are prokaryotic organisms. In other words, they do not possess a nucleus. A typical eukaryotic cell is so much larger and it possesses a nucleus. And it's hard to understand sizes. Um, so if I were to give sort of um, a scale analogy, I would say if I were my whole body was the size of a eukaryotic cell, then a bacteria that was infecting me would be the size of a football relative to my whole body. Okay, so they're pretty small, about the size of an organelle, but yet a virus is even smaller still, as you can imagine. So again, if I'm the eukaryotic cell and a football's a bacterium, then maybe a double A battery would be the size of a virus. And some are even smaller than that can be like the size of a, of a pill, like an aspirin, something like this. And so viruses are very small, and you can imagine that their discovery was difficult to make. Of course, they're microscopic. You need a microscope to see them. And when I say microscope, I'm talking about an electron microscope. And so they lack most of the, the machinery of a cell. And so they lack, of, of course, all organelles, and they lack uh, ribosomes and so if they lack ribosomes they have no ability to replicate on their own and so therefore by definition if you will uh, they're not considered to be living things and so but they do replicate but they replicate inside of a host cell so they're considered to be sort of intercellular parasites if you will and they're very small and it, you know again I can give you the number of nanometers here between 20 and 300 nanometers um, uh, bacteria as compared to the 500 and 1500 nanometers they're small but what really what we're talking about is their biological particles and so they're kind of an aggregate and let me try to illustrate this in other words a collection of nucleic acid so it goes something like this nucleic acid now one thing I want to say about nucleic acids if you're familiar with this that it could be DNA uh, viruses or it could be RNA viruses so you can have a choice on this and basically what we got is this nucleic acid surrounded by protein okay so picture this three-dimensional sort of like a circle this being the protein so basically it's sort of genes if you will segments of DNA along here uh, covered in a protein coat and so the only way that you could make more protein or make replicate the DNA is if this thing is sitting inside of a host cell. Now, this is very simplistic. There are some viruses that are a little bit more complex in structure, but we'll look at that in another video, the structure of viruses. But I will say this, I'll, I'll allude to it a little bit. Um, here's that internal nucleic acid structure like this, and so here's the nucleic acid. But Oftentimes, that's surrounded by protein. And so if you went in this direction, this would be a protein coat surrounding the nucleic acid. So this 
protein right here, shown in blue, would be this. And then sometimes viruses are even surrounded still by a phospholipid bilayer or a viral envelope as it's sometimes referred. And that would be the viral envelope or membrane would be this. So this would be outer and then with, within this is the protein and then the nucleic acid. And so this video in particular is gonna look at sort of the research uh, dis discovering viruses in the first place. And I find it kind of interesting that one of the very first things that we were most interested in, of course, we we're interested in human diseases caused by viruses, but maybe the, the second most important thing to humans is, uh, you know, yeah, somewhat sarcastically is uh, tobacco. <laughs> and so uh, tobacco farmers were noticing that their tobacco plants were becoming infected and they had a disease and they were sort of this is a picture of that they became a little bit yellow and spotted and, and became known as uh, like a little mosaic of spots. So tobacco mosaic disease. And of course we can't have this. We must look into what, what is hurting our tobacco plants. And so the research begins pretty early on and in, in, uh, when you look at this 1883. And so Adolf Meyer was sort of looking at the causal agent uh, that causes stunted growth of tobacco and this sort of mottled coloration and that was hurting the tobacco crops. Okay, so the search is on. Now what is it? So um, Mayer uh, concluded that the disease was infectious and what, what infectious means, if you don't know, is that, that it is transmitted. In other words, you could take sap, for example, from an infected tobacco leaf and sort of grind it up, mix it with water, and then spray it on subsequent leaves on other plants, and it would cause healthy plants to, to catch uh, tobacco mosaic disease, and so it was infectious, okay? That's interesting. And then um, he concluded that the disease must be some kind of really, really small uh, organism, like very small bacterium. Um, why is that? Because other scientists sort of demonstrated that the sap of the plant, when you take tobacco leaves and crush them up and you, you strain them through filtration. Now picture this as a, like a coffee filter where you have your, grind, your, your grounds here of the coffee bean and then water going through and obviously it's sort of like a colander uh, separating small things from large things. Um, the best filters at the time were unable to filter out the, the bacteria and so the, even though they tried this this juice still caused the disease but that doesn't mean too much that just could mean that uh, the bacteria is, is uh, just in, in incredibly small and it goes right through the filter you might be familiar with some filters commonly like for example if you're going camping and you're a little bit worried about bacteria or even protozoan uh, in the water supply you can simply uh, pump using this pump of water in the tube and it goes through the filter and then the water coming out is uh, basically uh, germ-free, so that's pretty cool. But this was not able to set to uh, to filter out the bacteria. And then uh, another thing is because the sap from one generation of plant infected other plants, and then another another plant and another plant, it was suggestive that the fact that the sap alone would eventually, if you kept doing that, eventually the sap would become further diluted, if you will, from plant to plant to plant, and that wasn't the case. It seemed like the, the infectious agent could reproduce. So when he tried infecting uh, multiple plants, it just kept going on, and so it, the, the agent wasn't, uh, so it wasn't a toxin. It was some kind of thing that was capable of reproducing. And so um, it's sort of why others ruled out the disease was uh, not due to a filterable toxin because like a that, that a bacteria produced because it was capable of infecting disease and so therefore it was um, over several generations therefore it was reproductive and what was really odd about this is that, so if you're following this so it's something that can reproduce it's something that's really really small because it couldn't be filtered and it wasn't really producing a toxin because that uh, itself would have been diluted. And then when you try to grow it, you try to grow the sap 
on, onto a nutrient uh, auger like this, a, a gel, an LB auger uh, plate, it's not growing. It won't grow, but it will grow uh, on a host. And so this is something that will only grow on a host, like for example, the leaves of the tobacco. And so just a little diagram, what I've been trying to describe is that you can take the sap from the tobacco and filter it, and then you could rub it, and so it's infectious on other tobacco um, plants. And so it's something that can reproduce uh, something that doesn't, that's not a toxin per se, something that's really small, and something that needs a host in order to reproduce. And so jumping right to the end of the, of the, of the story, in 1935, I, I would say somewhat recently, uh, Professor Stanley, uh, Wendell Stanley, crystallized the pathogen that causes tobacco mosaic disease, and it was caused by tobacco mosaic virus, or TMV. Uh, uh, so Professor Stanley, uh, researcher at the University of California, so pretty, pretty important. This is now a uh, present uh, transmission electron micrograph of what the tobacco mosaic virus looks like. It's rod shaped, and so there, there's many of them here, and here's a close up of one of them. And so if you're following what I was talking about earlier about the structure of the virus, it's interesting. The protein is this outer rod shape, but it's hollow on the inside, and the nucleic acid are coiled strands of RNA. And so that's kind of um, the background story of the discovery of viruses. So let me direct you here to uh, this short little video clip that I find very interesting about sort of a transition about the discovery of viruses and how they might replicate. A virus is an intracellular parasite that can reproduce only by taking over a host cell. A virus consists of a nucleic acid genome enclosed in a protein shell called a capsid. In the virus shown here, the genome consists of DNA, but some viruses have RNA. Some viruses are also covered by a membranous envelope that is derived from the membrane of the host cell. There is usually a lock and key fit between the proteins of the capsid and receptors on a particular type of host cell. So if this was, for the example, the virus attaches to a host cell and viral cell. DNA enters the cell. The viral DNA uses nucleotides and enzymes of the host cell to replicate itself. The viral DNA then commandeers other host cell materials and machinery to transcribe its genes into messenger RNA and translate the RNA message into capsid proteins. So the word there I really like in this video is commandeer. So notice when the virus came in, it's unable to make more copies of its own nucleic acid, so it uses the host cell like, for example, if this is a cell of a tobacco leaf, it uses the tobacco leaf's nucleotides in order to make more viral nucleotides. Isn't that brutal? And then it also uses the, the tobacco plant's amino acids to generate viral proteins. Now, it uses the ribosomes of the plant and its own amino acids to do this. Can you imagine? And then what it does is that it uses the cell entirely in order to replicate. And so, uh, pretty crazy. Viral DNA and capsid proteins then assemble into new viruses. Mature virus. So it's kind of like the, the plant cell becomes sort of like, if you will, a pinata, not filled with candy, but filled with viruses, cap protein capsids, nucleic acids. And so this is trouble for the cell. Leave the host cell often destroying the cell in the process. The viruses can go on to infect other cells, spreading the viral infection. So though they don't possess their own ribosomes, and they, they, aren't, they don't possess their own um, RNA polymerase or DNA polymerase, they use the cell's machinery in order to replicate. So they, they can reproduce, but they can only reproduce inside of a host cell. And then finally, this is kind of a cool video on discussing that. Uh, here's the virus particle with its envelope and proteins and genome. And you're going to see this represented as being within a pipette that's going to be dropped onto a petri dish uh, containing uh, human cells that are going to be susceptible to infection. So uh, what's, what's not shown here in the petri dish is some human cells that are being cultured, like some fibroblast cells. And so these viruses are going to attack them. 
here they are. <laughs> Here's a blow up of a single cell. Keep your eye here. These are the cell surface receptors. Here comes the virus part that's going to bind. So it enters the cell. Here comes the disassembly stage. The genomes will, in this case, enter the nucleus. Not all viruses have to do that. And now you see replication. Here comes the assembly reaction. And these cells are now, the capsids are going to now go to the cell surface and bud. So what we've just witnessed is a single cycle. So what's interesting here is that, you know, what's fascinating is that the virus can, there's a number of things. And so uh, this particular video isn't going to look at it. But when you, re when you look at replication, the cells are going to either, the virus is either going to destroy the cell or it's going to use the cell to replicate and bud off, but yet not try not to destroy the cell uh, quickly. And so it's kind of interesting. And so I hope you enjoyed this brief look at the discovery of viruses. I hope you stay tuned for other episodes of viruses. Thank you for watching.